This is the Danger Close Podcast. Beyond the Books with me, Jack Carr. Welcome to the Danger Close Podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. This is the first in a special series of podcasts recapping all the novels to date in the lead up to the publication of book six in the James Reese Terminal List series, Only the Dead. And I am joined by my friend and publicist at Simon & Schuster, David Brown, and Jesse Carey, producer on the Danger Close podcast. Let's kick it off with the Terminal List. Kicking it off, book one, The Terminalist. David, thank you so much for being here. I sincerely appreciate it. David Brown, my friend and publicist extraordinaire from Simon & Schuster, Atria, Emily Bessler Books. Thank you for being here. There is no place else I would rather be. This is my podcast. I've never been on a a major podcast before. Oh, come on, come on. Uh, And look at the the books behind you. Look at how those are all arranged like that. I like that. Yes, they're always like this. Interesting. Uh, I never have any other book behind me but Jack Carr books. So awesome. So awesome. No, I love that how they're turned like that. I'm going to have to think about this when I go and bring these books in front of me here back upstairs to the uh, to the office, I'm trying to figure out a good way to kind of display them. But I'm always grabbing them. There's, well, there's books everywhere up there. <laughs> but what we're going to do is dive in to all the books, starting with the terminal list, and just go through and give a quick little recap for people who uh, want to get a refresher before Only the Dead comes out on May 16th and uh, just talk about them for a little bit and then move on to True Believer and then move on to Savage Son and The Devil's Hand and In the Blood and then maybe we'll finish off with a little bit about Only the Dead. That sounds like a a good plan. Yeah, so this is sort of like before a new episode of a TV show, they say previously. There we go. And they show you scenes from the last one. That's it. That's exactly what this is. Uh Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, previously on. Dun-dun. Yep. Exactly. So, uh, yeah. How do we want to want to uh, go about doing this? Maybe at first off, well, tell people a little bit about being what it's like to be a publicist. So people are like, what is, cause I think people have a Hollywood version in their head of what a publicist is and maybe they, uh, conflate it with agent and a bunch of other things they might've seen on Californication or entourage or, or something like that. But, uh, what is a publicist at Simon and Schuster or a publicist in the publishing industry? Well, like I said at the beginning, I this is my first time on a major podcast like something like this because I'm usually putting the authors on these podcasts. So my job is to get attention for the authors and the books that they write and to get them reviews in newspapers and magazines and online and get them interviews on TV and radio and podcasts, send them out on their book tours, uh, get buzz going for new authors, established authors new books, established series. Awesome. Awesome. I love it. And this one, Only the Dead, those first two reviews, oh my goodness. I mean, for a real book spy, Ryan Steck, that was incredible. That blew me away. And then a few days later, Town Hall, John Nance, that one came out. Both of them I printed. And uh, I'm going to figure out if I can um, make, take little ads out because they're online and then maybe print, put them on the wall or something, put a frame them. Because those were, I mean, those were, those were I don't want to say it, but they were almost better written than the book. Well, you know, I have this theory (laughs) that reviewers write better reviews for the better written books. It's almost as if they raise the level of their own writing to match the level of the writing in the book. I've seen it time and time again that the uh, better written books have such beautifully written reviews about them. Yep. I've noticed that with film too. Uh, I've been listening to Quentin Tarantino's podcast um, and it's, uh, they go back and read some of the reviews from like the sixties, the seventies, the eighties. And some of those reviews are really well written, very clever and uh, yeah. And on point and really interesting to, to listen to when those guys read them. But um, all right, enough of that. Let's get into the book. What do we want to talk about with the terminal list? Well, I'll talk about terminal list. I will, we'll go through what happened in the terminal list. Like there's anyone here that there might be people here that are coming into this series with only the dead. So we should give them everything, but a lot of people already know. Uh, but, but I, what I want to start with is, uh, sort of my origin story with the terminal list. I remember Emily Bessler telling me that she has this new guy and giving me this book with the cover, uh, at the time, it sort of looked like a romance novel. So I was a little uh, tenuous going into it because it was like, it, it, you saw it like a- I, The black and white one, the black and white one, right? 
the black and white one, it was kind of like a muscular man. I may or may not have had a shirt on, but it looked like there were slashes through him. Yeah, like that's the first. Yeah. yeah, that was the first iteration. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so it, it kind of looked like an S and M type romance. So I was a little uh, confused why Emily was bringing this to me, but uh -huh. I read it, and it was it blew me away. And it's not very often that a new author, a new writer, blows you. For, if you get it from Emily, chances are it will. But to the level that it did was was very surprising. And I just had a call with a booker uh, who was recounting the time that I th people. This is. People remember where they are when they first heard of Jack Carr. Uh -huh. I mean, that's that's what you've become. So he was telling me, I remember I was in the parking lot after a meeting and you called me and you said, I've got the next big thing. And in his mind, he said, how many times have I heard that? But why it resonated with him and why he remembers where he was, was because he said, I was right. <laughs> Oh man, that is just too cool. That is just humbling. Uh, thank you. Do you remember the first, my first interview? Do you remember which one it was in New York? I do remember which one it was. And went upstairs to this place and it was, a, the host wasn't there. It was remote, but not only was it remote, it was a, essentially a closet, a small room. And there was no, in the age of Zoom and all these other things, I don't know if Zoom was around back then, but certainly a video teleconference type thing was, uh, was available. And it was just completely black in the room. Nothing, just a camera that you looked into. But even when the door shut and the lights were off, you couldn't barely even see that. There wasn't shadows. There wasn't ambient light. You were in, it was like a sensory deprivation chamber. And, uh, and they said, so I could hear the host. They've had a little thing in my ear. I could hear the host, but I'm just talking back into the darkness. And so there's no body language. You know, you can't really tell if you're supposed to wrap things up or not. And that was a that was an interesting one to start off with. That was, and I'll, and I think it was a channel that doesn't exist anymore. It may have only existed on, <laughs> on, on online. Uh, it was it's a host that doesn't exist anymore. But I'll say this, and here is why: uh, the way you've gone about your business has been chef's kiss. Is because the producer that booked that show that was pretty much filmed in a closet. We're going to see that producer on this tour at a pretty major network. Nice. That's awesome. That is awesome. You know, I heard, I heard Robert De Niro talking about something recently on uh, somewhere online about screenplays and movies and that sort of a thing. And I think it was him. And he said, when you go in and do a audition, um, yeah, you're going in, you're doing your audition, your jobs, that audition. But if you don't get it like that. The job, the job isn't getting the role. The job is going in and doing that audition. That's your job for that day. Go in and do that audition and then go on to the next one. Cause you never know if you don't get it, you never know who is going to be looking for other projects. Who's going to be working for someone else in the future. And I saw this firsthand with the terminal list when we were casting that saying, Oh, you know what? This, this person came in five years ago and auditioned for, you know, X, Y, or Z didn't get it, but they would be perfect for this part. Let me see if I can get in touch with them and bring them in here. And I saw that. And that was cool to hear it from somebody, an actor at that, at that stage, put it in those terms. Cause I think a lot of people might get discouraged if, uh, if they don't get the role or whatever, they're thinking of that as the job, but the job is to go in there, crush it. And you might not be the right person for that role for whatever reason, but guess what? In two years, in six months, in five years, whatever it is, you might be the perfect person for another project that that producer or that casting agent or whoever else is working on or that director. So there's uh, and there, he gave an example of, of a couple examples of it, but anyway, it's uh, it's kind of similar, kind of similar to this. Yeah, I mean, sometimes it's hard to do. You you uh, you're you're on uh, two straight all nighters. You're exhausted, <laughs> but you but it, the key is always be the best you you could be, and treat everybody as if they are the uh, king of the world, oh, and you, you behave that way, and you'll you'll succeed. Oh yeah, no, it's, uh, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's a good example. It's a good way to, to look at it. And I have a fun time with all these interviews because I love talking about books. I love talking about reading as you can tell. Um, but okay, let's get back on track. Terminal list. Uh, what do we want fans or readers or new readers or people that want to catch up to, uh, to know about the terminal list? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll start, I'll start you off by okay. telling you, uh, I gave this book, uh, to, uh, I go to this pizza place every week and this guy, Michael, who, who's behind the counter, the son of the owner, uh, is always talking about how he, he hasn't read an adult book in his life, uh, a, a book in his adult life. I gave him the terminal list. I said, trust me, 
came back. He, uh, the next time I to order, uh, next time I went there to order, I came back. I said, "Did you did you read it?" Yet? He said, "Did I read it?" I'm on to the next one. And he <laughs> said, "I couldn't believe it. Oh. The, the book started, and everyone was dead." <laughs> Uh huh. I didn't really realize that that's not how I didn't realize there were rules to certain things. I only find out found out about certain rules later on uh, in Hollywood uh, with the screenwriting side of the house because there are more rules there because you can't um, just create anything. You have a budget and uh, you have locations and that sort of a thing. Whereas with a book, you don't have that. It's just you and you can create any set piece you want. If you want the Golden Great bridge to explode from aliens coming down from outer space. You can do that in a book. Uh, if you have a budget in a film, then you have to take that into account. Um, but there are certain things also like not killing the family in the first episode of a season. It's like one of those things that's not usually, we, we broke a lot of quote unquote rules in the Terminalist TV show. Um, and they let us, it was amazing. Uh, anytime Amazon, cause it goes up to the top and those people have, they know the rules and then they would come back down with notes and we have a discussion about these certain things. And, uh, I think almost every single time they ended up saying, okay, go for it. We'll see, we'll see how this works. And, uh, we got to, we got to break some of those rules on the Terminalist when it came to, to the scripts and to filming. Well, I'm glad that you didn't know, uh, the rules or the unwritten rules in, in mm -hmm. uh, novels either, because you broke a lot of them uh, in the <laughs> first book. Uh, you you, uh, you went there. You did things that others you went a little further than a lot of other writers uh, would dare. Or to give great credit to Emily Bessler, your editor, you went further than a lot of editors would allow their writers to also. And I thought about that going into it because I, in my first experience in publishing and it's Emily Bessler, it's the one person who I wanted to be my editor and publisher. And now it's on her desk and then she read it and then she called and wanted to option it. And we met up and, and, uh, and all, all that sort of a, a thing. But in my head, I was like, wow, if Emily Bessler wants to change anything, if she wants to put, uh, robots from outer space coming down, uh, like a transformer film and have that as part of this novel, guess what's going in? These transformers are coming into the novel. Uh, but she had hardly any, um, any edits. They were all, uh, as far as content goes, I mean, any like, would he really say this here? Would he really do this here? Can you explain this a little bit more? Like, it was that kind of kind of thing, like, like, like tweaking and keeping it on track uh, type of a thing rather than, oh, you know what we need to do here? In my experience, this is what works. This is what doesn't. Let's change this. Like, it was none of that. And there never, never has been. So I feel extremely fortunate on that front that, uh, that she, that she went, let me do this. Well, let's let's recap it. Let's recap uh, it. Let's so do it. Let's recap it uh, instead of uh, instead of just uh, praising it. Let's recap it for the people <laughs> that may not have seen it or may need a refresher before they uh, go further in the series. Let's do it. Uh, opens up and everyone's dead, as as uh, Michael from Mario <laughs> said. That's funny. Then what? That's funny. Um, yeah, so opens up really it was a sniper shot, and I always had visions of uh, the film. Uh, at the time, I'm thinking film as I'm typing it away in my little office off our bedroom in Coronado, California, as I'm still in the SEAL teams. Um, so I have a, a song playing in my head as James Reese is walking through the wilderness here in the United States on a stretch of road that I used to drive to take our daughter to camp in Wyoming, and. Uh, and how he sets up the shot and takes this shot. And uh, so so there's a person <laughs> that dies very quickly, yes. Um, and then it goes back to Afghanistan and uh, sets up what the, uh, the, the situation that uh, the reader has just been introduced to in this first prologue. And uh, back in Afghanistan, and I'm thinking about feelings and emotions and lessons learned over the last, at that time, 16 years at war about when I was writing it and uh, incorporating some of those lessons into that first chapter and thinking about people I'd served with and some of their personalities and how I was going to um, describe them as we come in for that last little huddle before going off to hit a target. And, uh, and yeah, and then disaster strikes. Um, and sometimes leaving some of the violence out or some of the specifics out can be more powerful, both in film, television, and in novels. Um, and I think you need a kind of a good mix of that as you go along, because oftentimes a reader or a viewer, uh, what they come up with in their head about the horror of what's just happened or what's been set up can be worse than what you would visually portray on the screen or in the pages of a novel. So, um, so disaster strikes and James Reese wakes up in a hospital, Bagram Airfield, the place where I spent a little time back in the day. And, uh, his buddy Boozer is right there with him and fills him in a little bit about what had happened 
and goes off into interrogation, into a, uh, a questioning from NCIS. And I describe NCIS, I think, almost exactly as they are uh, in, uh, in the pages. Sorry, NCIS people, but <laughs> you know it's true. And, uh, and, and we actually, we put it in the show, too. I was, it was pretty interesting to get that into the, the pages of the script, which is cool. But, uh, but yeah, it goes into this interrogation, and I've been on the other side of that desk from NCIS, so I got to go back in my mind also and take those feelings and emotions and apply them to this completely fictional narrative uh, and then move on from there. And then very quickly, also, the, uh, the family, does not they don't make it long. They make it longer in the TV show uh, than they do in the book. That's for sure. And in the book, I describe a homecoming that was almost exactly like, um, because he's remembering before he gets home what he's expecting to find. And uh, when he goes back in the memory banks, I went back in the memory banks to what it was like to come home. And I describe almost exactly what it was like to come home from one of my deployments at that time of night with my wife and daughter on the couch. And I got to describe all that in the book. Um, And of course, James Reese is thinking about that as his Land Cruiser pulls onto his street and then in the book and the show is a little bit, little bit different how all that goes down, but uh, but still similar. It keeps the keeps the spirit of the book, and uh, and he walks into uh, his worst nightmare, and uh, from then on, it's time to take a breath and figure out how to move forward. Take a knee, mourn for a minute, and then get to work. And one thing that was important to me as I started writing this was what well, was all the movies that I'd seen growing up. And how all that, that voiceover, there were two guys in the 80s, essentially, that did the voiceover in the background of the trailers. And um, they would always say something like, he has nothing left to lose. And uh, and I remember seeing all those movies, which I loved. But at the same time, I was always like, well, he could go to prison. He could die. Like, there's some things you could still lose here. Um, and so I thought, how do I take that away? And I thought, well, what if the protagonist is dying? What if he only has a certain, so you introduce that ticking clock. Um, but he doesn't know exactly when it's going to expire. Um, but how do I take absolutely everything away from him? How do I make him a modern day samurai? Cause samurai would go into battle in feudal Japan thinking they were already dead. Cause they thought that made them more effective and efficient warriors. And so I said, how do I, I thought, how do I do that to a modern day warrior? And hence the conspiracy with, uh, the testing of drugs on our most, uh, elite soldiers, special operators, and, uh, those side effects that needed to be covered up. So gave him that ticking clock, gave him absolutely nothing to live for because he essentially has one foot in the grave and he doesn't know how long he has before he's going to be done. And so he has to get through this list, figure out the conspiracy, work his way essentially uh, up the list is a better way to say it. Right. So he wants to figure out what happened, who did it. He makes a list of who did it and goes after him and hence launches a tradition that now spans through all your books of titles that have multiple meanings. This is true. That's right. That's right. That was important to me too. Uh, The terminal list has multiple meanings in there. Um, Is it, uh, is it his list, his terminal list or the people on it (laughs) are terminal because they're on that list. Um, So I do like that for the title to have multiple meanings, just like I like people to uh, have to get different things from it, depending on how deep they want to go into the storyline. Like if you grab that, I wanted people to be able to grab the terminal list off a shelf in a bookstore in the airport and get on their flight to vacation and uh, have a great read. Uh, so that's one level. And then the other level is really exploring the psyche of someone who is essentially becoming the insurgent, becoming the terrorist that he'd been fighting, that he'd been studying uh, for the previous 16 years at war when I wrote it anyway. Um, So there's that side of it. And then even deeper, it's about someone who is bringing the wars from Iraq and Afghanistan back to the front doors of people who have been sending young men and women to their deaths for all these years. So uh, so there's a few different ways that one uh, could read it. There are things that people could get from it that are different from somebody else, depending on how deep they want to go. And, uh, and that was important to me as I was writing it as well. All right, let's talk about Spartan Forge. You can find them at S-P-A-R-T-A-N-F-O-R-G-E dot A-I. Go check them out. They have an amazing app. Spartan Forge is an all-encompassing hunting and planning application powered by artificial intelligence developed by a u.s army warrant officer conducting intelligence preparation of the battlefield in the special missions arena for our nation's most elite operators the app offers military-based targeting for hunters 
The technology uses artificial intelligence-powered movement prediction. It features movement prediction paired with current and historical wind data, current forecasts, and state data. They partnered with Premier Universities to collect data on deer movement. It is as accurate and testable as scientifically possible. No snake oil, no bullshit. Its UAV map features next-level imagery detail, the highest resolution offered on the market, with up to seven years of historical imagery. Its Blue Force tracker allows users to share pins and location data to a set group of peers in a user-defined area. The LiDAR map lets hunters look through the trees and structures to see topography like never before, giving the user a detailed viewpoint of trails, beds, and more. And the Lambda map is fully customizable, set to parameters selected by the user for fast access. It will also indicate public and private land boundaries. The journal feature lets users keep track of every detail of their hunt, write historical descriptions, and add photos and waypoints, all while pulling historical weather pattern data. And its desktop app features Eastman's Tag Hub. Spartan Forge works hand in hand with Eastman's to integrate Tag Hub app into Spartan Forge, providing Western hunting draw odds and stats. Users can search by location, species, season, and trophy potential to best plan their Western hunt. Get 30% off if you sign up with the code DANGERCLOSE at www spartanforge.ai that is s-p-a-r-t-a-n f-o-r-g-e dot a-i that is the highest discount they have ever offered and it is perfect to get started on that summer scouting check them out spartanforge.ai Uh, two things before I, I forget. Yes. Uh, one, the scene that you described with the family and, and returning home and, and the aftermath, uh, it did to th- readers of these types of thrillers something that probably either never happened or rarely ever happens, and they they shed tears. I saw so much feedback from readers who were uh, destroyed by that and literally cried which is something that they probably weren't expecting to happen reading a book like this. And I think it sets the entire series off on a course where readers know that this author, this series, this character is something different. Oh, wow. Thank you. You know, I hadn't thought about this till just now, but I wonder if I put that so early in the book so I wouldn't have to uh, describe a wife and daughter that were so similar to my own um, uh, for five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, chapters before something happens to them or take them closer to the end because then you really get to know know them and then you're there you take them away but that almost seems kind of like a i don't know thinking about it now i think that kind of in this instance anyway might even cheapen it um but if you because if you introduce them so early on you don't really have you have limited time to establish a relationship between the reader and those characters. Um, So you need to um, hit people with something that's gonna be emotionally jarring because of what it is, not because that you've described a birthday party and you've been along to pick up at school and you've been along for all these chapters of the grocery store and out to dinner with the wife and the husband and then and got to know each other and all that. No, you don't really get to know them at all before they're gone. Um, So that's, that's interesting, I hadn't really thought about that before. Yeah, except the emotions that you put in it, it, mm-hmm. it kind of—that's what I mean. Uh, mm-hmm. it kind, you kind of like put all of that in and concentrate. Yeah. So it was there. It, yeah, that's what I mean. Like doing it right there without building it yeah. up for uh, for uh, fifty thousand words or something like that. But uh, but yeah, no, that's interesting. And the, like the office I describe in there, it's very similar to mine. In fact, when I was typing away, I just looked to my left, and I have all my books right there. And back in our house in Coronado, California, and uh, was looking at the shelf, and I was like, okay, I think I'll put that there, that there, that there, that there. So I just took books that were on my shelf about warfare and insurgencies and counterinsurgencies, terrorism, and put those into the storyline, which also ended up in the opening credits to the show on Amazon. Uh, I actually took my books, put them in a huge box, sent them out there, because when you do an opening credit type scene, um, that's a specialized company that does that. And so sent them out there, and then they did that opening title credit sequence after everything was all filmed as part of the post-production process. So they got all my books, and then they chose certain ones based on color and all that stuff that was gonna look good as the camera pans in that opening scene of credits. 
That's fantastic. That's yeah. that's interesting. And the other thing I wanted to bring up before we uh, complete the uh, story of, of the terminal list is that in going over the notes uh, for the terminal list, uh, I was struck by when this was written. May, and maybe it was because I was naive back then. But when this was, but since it's been, since it was written, uh, so much have has kind of come out, been unmasked about the government, about the media, about what's really going on around us. That as insane as what goes on in this book, it just seems so much more plausible than it did when you wrote it. Yeah, I mean that, that that is true. Either either fortunately or unfortunately, um, maybe fortunately for uh, for the series as a whole, uh, not so fortunately for the country, perhaps. But uh, but really, it shouldn't have been too much a surprise for those who are students of history, um, because this was really set up by me going back and studying the church hearings and the Pike Committee hearing in the seventies um, that really exposed some overreach by different uh, entities in the federal government, particularly the CIA, and uh, going deeper into it, some medical experiments they did on people without their knowledge, uh, college students, prisoners, people in mental institutions, and members of the military. Uh, and of course, there were a lot of changes that came out of those hearings in the 70s. There were reorganizations and protocols put in place that were supposed to keep those things from happening again. And I thought, well, what if enough time has elapsed where uh, a few people up there, the senior levels have kind of uh, forgotten about that or maybe wanted to skirt those rules and uh, for their own end. And uh, so that's so the basis for all these novels really are in a, in a foundation of reality. So let's uh, shall we wrap wrap the terminalist up in a little bow or yeah. wrap it up like a like an intestine around a tree maybe <laughs> oh so, speaking of that way, do you yeah. do you remember when you visited the simon schuster's office and uh, a certain employee came up to you and surprised you about how uh, passionately in love she was with that scene yes i certainly do and i was a little nervous about it because we're in this room at simon and schuster and i think uh Everyone was there except it was female, maybe except for two, two people. Um, so, you're, you know, there's a lot of, lot of people there and they're, uh, they're female. And I didn't know if this book would really resonate with uh, uh, a female readership. It's a little, little violent, a little, uh, you know. Um, and, I, and this one lady was just looking at me from, uh, you know, across the room. And she wasn't really saying, saying too much, but I kept looking over and she was like looking at me. And I was like, there's not a smile. You know, there wasn't anything like that. And I was just getting a little, a little nervous. I'm like, oh, she hated it. Oh, my gosh. Uh, and she's going to say something or uh, or is she just going to leave? And then people started, you know, leaving and going back to, to work or whatever, or out for the day. I think it was at the end of the day. And, uh, and then it gets fewer and fewer people in there. And then she comes over. I'm like, oh, here it goes. And she was like, you know that scene uh, in the swamp where the intestines get tied around the tree and he gets eaten alive um, by the swamp? And I was like, oh, here we go. And she's like, I loved it. And I was like, yes, <laughs> that's awesome. So, so that was really, that was really cool. Yeah. And here's the blade from right here. So actually it was two blades in that scene. So this is a karambit made by my buddy, Andrew Arabito at half face blades right there. And, uh, they use that to eviscerate him. And then this one right here, uh, it's made by Winkler knives, but, uh, designed by my buddy Dom Rosso at Dynamis Alliance. And this is the Razorback. So this is uh, a tribute to our friend, Adam Brown, who was killed in Afghanistan and he was a Razorback fan. So, uh, this is a blade that pays tribute to him. And, uh, I leave this stuck into the tree, holding the intestines in just so that the people coming to investigate or that to find this body have no question as to who, did it because James Reese wants to send a message to those last few names on the list that he is coming. So uh, that was a cool one. <laughs> so that was one of the many creative ways that James Reese dispelled of his <laughs> defense of his, of his terminal list. Yeah, uh, the uh, conspiracy unraveled. He figured it out. He got to everyone. Yep, I guess we can go uh, through all of that because it's not too much of a surprise anymore because there's a second book. But when you're writing the first one and when you don't have a second book out there for people reading it, then they don't know if he's going to make it. And it's set up for him not to survive. So everybody re who read it in, uh, in 2018 before uh, True Believer came out in 2019, they didn't know if he was going to make it or not. And, uh, and then I, I, the way I ended it, I wrote the final chapter in the place that it goes down in. 
So I'm right there on Fisher's Island writing those chapters and writing that part in the Atlantic at the How It Ends, which leaves it kind of up in the air a little bit. Um, so people might not know that he survives unless they were to dig deep and find out that it was a two book deal from the start or uh, yeah. anything like that, but very few people are going to do that. So it's a different reading experience, I think, for the first novel, if you don't know that there are others. Um, but uh, as it stands now, there are multiple others. And the sixth one right here, Only the Dead, coming out May 16th. But uh, for other people that are listening that are wondering about, I get a lot of questions about paperback and audio and trade. So Terminalist right here comes out in hardcover first and all the books thus far come out in hardcover audiobook on the same day narrated by Ray Porter. And yes, these are CDs for people watching. People too, still do have CDs, uh, CD players. Uh, so audiobook drops the same day as hardcover. And then like, what would you say, like six months later, seven months later, it kind of it varies a little bit, but that's when the paperback comes out. And in this case, there were two. So if you have one with a Trident on it, then that is a collector's edition now because uh, very soon after this was published, the military sent a letter to all the major publishers saying, you can't put Tridents on the covers of books anymore. So then it was published again without the Trident on it. So that's that. And then the trade. And the trade is probably one of my favorites. Um, and it's just a larger, a little bit smaller than a hardcover, a little bit bigger than a mass market paperback. But this is the trade edition right here. And uh, and I just really like this edition. It's really, um, it's still small enough to throw in your backpack, that sort of a thing, but larger than a smaller mass market paperback. So that's, that's how those go down. And then for the media tie-in, I asked Emily if we could do a hard cover edition with Chris Pratt. Usually they don't do hard covers for um, republications of books that are made into films. Usually it's just a paperback with the actor on the cover. But uh, I asked her if we could do this and she said yes. And I wanted to do a new forward that talked about how the show came to be, how the book came to be. So I wrote that and I got to record that part of the new audiobook, which was much more difficult than I thought it was going to be. And I already uh, respected uh, Ray Porter so much for what he did. Well, even more so now that I had to read the, <laughs> just the foreword. It doesn't even have any accents or funny sounding, you know, names to pronounce. Uh, and then we included a bunch of photos from the set in the middle. So this is a limited edition collectors right here, hardcover and mass market paperback with Chris Pratt on it and the trade. So those are all the different editions of the terminal list that are out there in print and in audio. So that's the, that's the book. And then, you know, I always knew I was going to write too, but we can talk about that when we go into true believer next. Well, Jack, that was a great behind the scenes look at the publication and, and how it felt uh, for the terminal list for you to debut, uh, for uh, me personally to work on this debut. Uh, but to give uh, the audience the proper recap and a high level uh, rundown of what happened in the Terminalist so that they know going into the next book and the rest of the series, the producer, Jesse, is going to uh, provide that for us. Yeah, so a lot happens in the book, guys. I'm going to keep it high level. But Jack, as you said, uh, it opens with uh, James Reese's uh, kind of uh, platoon or, or unit getting ambushed in Afghanistan. Um, he returns home uh, shortly thereafter. His He finds that his, his pregnant wife and daughter have been murdered. Uh, meanwhile, he's experiencing the, these headaches. And along the way, he unites with a, an investigative reporter, Katie, who becomes a major uh, uh, character throughout the franchise. And what they discover through a series of Katie's investigations and uh, uh, James Reese's very effective interrogation uh, tactics is that uh, uh, high-powered people in Washington? Now, some of these there's a there's a JAG lawyer, there's a a, a senator with aspirations that she wants to become, or or who's married. Uh, I'm sorry, a senator who's married to the Secretary of Defense who has aspirations to become president have all conspired with a really uh, powerful corporation called Capstone, um, who is conducting medical research for a what they believe would be a treatment uh, that would prevent PTSD. Um, and it's led by this really nefarious figure, Steve Horn. And what Katie and Reese are able to discover through their kind of adventure through the first novel is that all these forces have conspired to unknowingly test this drug on Reese and uh, 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 his unit. And uh, they find out that it's actually causing brain tumors. So the ambush was a way of killing off all of the evidence of this sort of secret 
testing. Um, when Reese finds out that, uh, you know, this has happened, he ends up making a list of people to extract vengeance on. And through uh, some of his previous relationships, one is with uh, Marco del Toro, who's a powerful figure that uh, is well connected, possibly through the DEA in Mexico, through some of the people he used to serve with that will become major figures later in the novels, including Liz O'Reilly, an Apache helicopter pilot, uh, Rafe Hastings, a, a fellow sniper that is going to play a major role in, in the upcoming book. They're able to uncover this plot and uh, James Reese is able to extract his his vengeance and the novel closes with him finally being able to confront uh, the Hartleys, who are the senator and the, his wife, who's the secretary of defense, Steve Horn, who's the head of Capstone, and who we thought was one of his best friends, Ben Edwards, who's been kind of guiding him along his journey, but turns out to be one of the masterminds of this entire conspiracy. Uh, James Reese is able to execute them, but in, in one of the final scenes, and this is the major spoiler here, uh, they have Katie uh, with a bomb around her neck. And what's, it seems that James, that, that Reese has disregarded her safety while he's, he's kind of uh, killing the, the final bad guys. And we don't know if he know, we don't, we're not sure if Reese has disregarded her safety and knowing that uh, Ben Edwards is not going to detonate the bomb around her neck or if he didn't care. And so it kind of leaves with this relational tension between uh, Reese and Katie. And in the final scene, Reese is able to escape uh, the compound where these uh, final vengeance happen, and he sails off in a yacht that was belonging to the Hartleys out to sea. And uh, Katie, meanwhile, is able to write an expose that blows the lid off the entire conspiracy. I know I breezed over a lot, but that's kind of the overarching uh, plot of the terminal list. Uh, uh, David, do you have any questions for Jack about kind of some of the nuances of the story here? I have a question for you first, actually. That was amazing, and Jack will, will appreciate this reference. When you do the recap for True Believer, would you do it like the Micro Machine Man? <laughs> I, yes, I will. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Uh, Jesse, I'm going to give you a B plus, though. I'll give you a B plus because okay, it's, uh, it's Liz Riley, and it is the Hastings family yacht that is brought down by uh, Rafe that's Hastings right. sister and docked on Fisher's Island. But that's pretty close. That's not, that's not bad. That was pretty, uh, I'm very you, impressed. You'll, you'll have to forgive me. I binged, uh, read all of these again for the second time through. So there's a couple details, but either I, I appreciate the B plus. I'm going to go for a, in Let's, the next we'll see episode. what happens with true believer. Yeah. I'll be, I'll be playing close attention. Um, you know, you know, you, at the end, I'm going to grab this one right here. Uh, so at the end, that scene that you just mentioned at the end. So I was writing that in, uh, Fisher's Island where it takes place and you know I was writing put all this work in getting to this last spot it's pretty much written chronologically and uh, and I get here to to the end um, and I loved this part I mean you know it's, it's talking about your own work sounds very strange to say that but I think this is where I knew I was like yes like because you know you have questions as you're going you've never done this before you don't know if you're gonna have an audience is anyone gonna like it are they all gonna hate it and I got to this one part right here, right at the end, right before the epilogue. And it's, uh, it's Katie, and she's about to fly off with Liz. Reese is going to close the door, stepping back. And Katie snaps out of her trance because she's in a little bit of a, a uh, of shock after what she just went through in the preceding pages here. And she says, Reese, how did you know Ben didn't have that detonator connected? How did you know he wouldn't blow my head off? Reese paused, looked Katie in the eye, and over the sound of the wind, the propeller and the rain replied, I didn't before shutting the door and moving off at a run toward the marina. After I wrote that, I was like, oh yeah. I'm like, guys are going to love this. <laughs> Women, maybe not so much. But I get more comments about that line than, uh, than probably any other in the entire series right there. And that one just... That one just felt right because it put it all in. But then I, I wrote myself what they call, they call it writing yourself into a corner. And because uh, now you have to deal with that. I mean, great line. I loved it. Awesome. It plays so well right there. Uh, and I haven't really thought of anyone. I haven't read anybody doing something like that before with a main protagonist like this. But then you are written. You have to deal with that later because now Katie becomes a main character in books going forward. And how are they supposed to connect after he essentially says, uh, I didn't. I didn't know. Like, I thought your head was going to blow off, but it didn't matter because I'm getting my vengeance for my family. Nothing is going to stand in my way. And so I had to think about that. I had to let that percolate all the way through the next novel, True Believer, and into this, uh, the third one, Savage Son. And then I figured out how to deal with it. And I think, yeah, I love, 
the way that uh, you have to get creative with these things. Yeah, and, it's, and uh, it's, it's creative not, problem solving. And I love how I can't. I, I you know, uh, you talking about loving your own work is crazy, but uh, it, it was it was writing yourself into a corner. And that's fun to solve these problems then, solve them in creative ways. And, and uh, yeah, so anyway, I had to deal with that, but that was a fun one to write. And most relationship experts would not advise starting off a uh, relationship that way. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> but Jack, Jack, is, 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 cause I, you know who people think Katie is based on. Is Katie a real person? Uh, I don't know what you're talking about, David, but uh, let me see, is Katie a real person? And uh, that's classified. What about Marco? So Marco is based on a friend of mine in Coronado, California, and uh, who has a very similar name. And uh, does he have that same background? I don't know. I don't know. So you're willing to go a little bit further on to who Marco is based on than Katie? Well, if Katie is based on anyone. All right, now you're talking <laughs> me in the corners. <laughs> uh, one last question. Uh, you, like you said earlier, you had a two book deal. You knew there was going to be a second book, uh, but you tackled big pharma in this one, big government. You tackled the military. You tackled the leadership. You tackled the like. Did, were you afraid that you were going all in and had nothing left? Nope. I always uh, I knew there's always, there always a little something left in the tank. And uh, for these kind of novels, I don't think I'll ever run out of ideas. Uh, one because I just love to create these stories and uh two because our senior level military leaders and uh elected representatives in government are sure giving me a lot to work with these days so i don't think i'll ever want to run out of ideas going forward but i like each novel to have a, a different theme and uh with the terminal list that's what i did i started with that yellow sticky right on the side of my computer right there it said revenge that's what i wrote on there so i would be uh, i would tie everything back to that theme rather directly or indirectly and then i morphed it a little bit and wrote revenge without constraint to just uh put kind of a little more of a point on it. And uh, I think that really helped guide the writing process. And I think it's the reason that there weren't very many content edits by the time it got to Emily's desk. That really helped guide the guide the process. And I've done that with each and every novel since. No, I said I had one question left, but I lied. I have one more question. Uh, the, the nine mil 45 boozer situation. What oh, yeah. had you come up with with that? That's pretty unique type of a scenario. Yep, that one is in there because that was only only if you are a true student of the gun would something like that stand out to you? And uh, James Reese is a student. That's why I chose this tomahawk right here, uh, this Winkler tomahawk, as his kind of weapon of choice, his totem, um, and also the uh, the logo for for me and this uh, and this post military life. But uh, a true student of the gun would ask that question, and uh, and so a lot of people in that that community, it means something to them that you that. Uh, that you're so, I don't know, I guess in tune with it. And it's such a part of your character that it speaks to them being a student of the gun. And then it works its way into the plot. So Boozer, that was the one thing that he, and we worked it into the series too on, on TV. It is the, uh, the first thing that gives Reese a clue that this is not what it seems. Uh, Boozer would never have shot himself with a nine mil. He did not like that nine mil. He was a 45 guy. And, uh, and uh, the suicide was with a nine mil. And so Reese knew something was not right. So that really kicks off the whole thing is, uh, is that little piece of information right there. All right, so let's, let's do like Reese and sail off into the sunset and move our way towards True Believer. Let's do it. <laughs>